Hi, I'm Chris Adkin. I'm going to talk to you about Kubernetes and OpenShift infrastructure for SQL Server 2019 Big Data Clusters. By way of a quick introduction, I'm a SQL Server Solutions Architect at Pure Storage. I've been using SQL Server for 20 years. I was heavily involved in the SQL Server 2019 Early Adopter Program. And along with Microsoft's very own book, Woody, I'm the co-author of a workshop that can be found on GitHub. Uh, which is Big Data Clusters from Bare Metal to Kubernetes. Big Data Cluster 101, what is a Big Data Cluster? To put this as simply as possible, it is a scale-out data platform largely based on Apache Spark, which runs on Kubernetes. It consists of a number of pools. You have a master pool, which hosts one or more master instances, dependent on how you deploy your big data cluster. These typically provide access to your big data cluster from the outside world via tools such as SQL Server Management Studio or Azure Data Studio. You have a compute pool, which is a, a number of containerized SQL Server instances for the express purpose of shuffling and aggregating data. This sits above your data pool, which again, is a number of containerized SQL Server instances uh, furnished for the purpose of providing fast data access. Your compute pool also sits above your storage pool. Your storage pool is the engine room of your big data cluster. It is the one part which does all the heavy lifting. It comprises of storage pool pods. Each storage pool pod has its own containerized SQL Server instance, Spark instance, and HDFS node. You then have an application pool, which is where you store and run Jupyter Notebooks, Flask applications, and DTSX packages. Your Kubernetes cluster. This comprises of a number of components, three major components in, in total at the highest level of abstraction. You have master nodes or control plane nodes. If you're using OpenShift terminology, these form the control plane or the brains of your cluster. Typically, they don't require a massive amount of resources. So you can get away with four logical processors per master node, eight gig of memory for a master node host for dev and test. For production, you want to double that to 16 gig. You then need to store your cluster state somewhere. That somewhere is a number of ETCD instances. So ETCD is a low latency key value stored database. Uh, ETCD originated at CoreOS that was acquired by, acquired by Red Hat. And it's generally recommended that you have a minimum of three of these for a production grade cluster. You then need somewhere to run your actual application, which is your big data cluster. In this case, that somewhere is your worker nodes. Each worker node requires a minimum of eight logical processors, 64 gig of memory, and 100 gig of storage for images. I tend to go with 200 gig because you also need somewhere to install and run your operating system. And again, for a production grade cluster, a minimum of three of these is recommended. As I said earlier, the, the storage pool does all the most of the heavy lifting for your big data cluster. What I therefore recommend is, is that you dedicate one or more worker nodes to your storage pool. The way you do this is via worker node labeling which you do via kubectl so in this example i'm going to label two of my worker nodes with the bdc hyphen shared label uh, i've called these in my lab zca bdc worker one and worker two and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to give my final worker node a label of bdc hyphen storage what you would then do is in your configuration you would then change the labels from the defaults to match what you've given your worker nodes via kubectl. Then when you deploy your big data cluster, AZ data knows which worker node to put which component on. 
Another point is that whatever worker node runs a storage pool instance, that instance will try and grab as much resource as it can get its hands on on that worker node. So that is another good reason why you want to do this. Networking. In the world of Kubernetes, there's, there's two types of networking. There's networking that services access to your cluster from the outside world. The traffic that is involved with this kind of network is colloquially referred to as north-south traffic. You then have traffic, network traffic that's internal to your cluster. This is commonly referred to as east-west traffic. Uh, you have something called an overlay network which handles this. Uh, your overlay network is underpinned by a container network interface plugin. This can be something like Flannel or Calico or, or Weave if you're doing this on premises. I typically use Calico. If you're deploying Kubernetes in the public cloud, AKS is, is one of the, the fastest ways to do this. Please be aware that the, the container network interface plugin you end up with is this thing called KubeNet. Now this might be fine for dev test, learning, kicking the tires purposes. However, if you have something you want to run in production and you've got heavy north-south traffic, you want to go with Azure Container Network Interface and Microsoft do a fantastic job of, of documenting how to install and configure this. There's two broad ways of, of, of deploying a Kubernetes cluster. So you can use Kubernetes as a service. This might be AKS in Azure, EKS in AWS, GKE in the Google Cloud. What you will generally end up with, though, is you will end up with services for accessing your applications from the outside world, which have load balancing uh, functionality by default and these are called load balancer services if however you deploy kubernetes vanilla kubernetes on premises you get these things called node ports a node port works by exposing a port on each host that hosts a worker node so this this absolutely works however it's not what you want for production so what you can do is you can use a hardware load balancer from the likes of uh, companies such as F5. But what I'd recommend you do is if you want something that's easy and quick to get up and running with is you use something called Metal LB, which is also free. And we all like free. There's two steps to this. You need to install this in the first place using kubectl. So I'm assuming that your cluster is up and running. You've got kubectl installed. You've got a, a configuration file containing a context for accessing your Kubernetes cluster. So this usually lives in a file called config under .cube, the .cube directory under the home directory of your user. Once you've got all that stuff installed up and running, install Metal LB by running uh, kubectl apply commands against the manifest. Next up, note this is only a two-step process. You want to configure Metal LB. Layer two, as in layer two of the OSI seven layer model, uh, the layer two configuration is the easiest, fastest way to go. What you do is you create yourself a little YAML file as per this excerpt. Note the IP addresses at the bottom. That is the internal IP address arranged for your worker nodes, which you get via kubectl get nodes. You then create your configuration map in your cluster via kubectl apply command. In this case, I've called the YAML file metal lb config. Then in your configuration, uh, control.json file before you actually deploy your big data cluster you want to change each occurrence of no port to load balancer so you can do that via a text editor such as nano or vi or you can use it via uh, the the az data commands which allow you to use json path quick word on tools so it's common knowledge that it's generally not a good practice to install management tools on production servers as pointed out by these people on the right. 
The same thing applies to the world of Kubernetes. So what I'd recommend is that you build yourself a tools or deployment server to host Kubespray. Kubespray is a free community tool based on Ansible, not just for standing up your Kubernetes cluster, but also for adding worker nodes, for rebuilding your control plane, for performing upgrades, which I'll come on to later. Uh, do not roll your own scripts, okay? So people might say to you, oh, well, you know, I need to be using KubeADM. And you should use KubeADM via KubeSpray. Do not roll your own scripts, okay? People who do this for a living, Kubernetes professionals, they do not roll their own scripts with Bash, okay? Just about everybody in the dog that I know that does this seriously, they use KubeSpray. KubeCTL, which is the command line tool for uh, deploying uh, objects to your Kubernetes cluster, inspecting objects, monitoring, uh, you need that. Helm, you do not need Helm to deploy a big data cluster. However, what you will typically find is that there's tools that you need in a wider ecosystem that you will need to install by Helm. And Helm is the, the de facto package management system for Kubernetes. Always prefer Helm version three because it only requires a client component. If you use Helm one or Helm two, it requires this thing called Tiller. Tiller requires elevated access permissions which your security people will not like. They will not like you for doing that, for using that. So please use Helm version three onwards. Finally, you need AZ data. I say you need this, you can use Azure Data Studio. I prefer to use AZ data because I generally prefer uh, an infrastructure as code means of doing things. Storage, you need a storage plugin. You can use this thing called ephemeral storage. However, never use this in production. The minute a pod, which is the unit of co-scheduling for your containers, the minute that moves from one worker node to another in your cluster, you will lose the state associated with that pod. So you need a container storage plugin. Generally speaking, something that adheres to the container storage interface standard is the way to go. And the reason why the container storage interface standard matters is because it is the, the focal point of all development innovation around what the, the Kubernetes storage special interest group is doing. So this guy on the right, this is Saad Ali. He is a staff engineer at Google. He works within the, the Kubernetes storage special interest group. He is the co-creator of the CSI standard. He delivered a fantastic session at KubeCon 2019, last year in Barcelona. So last year, back in the midst of time when we could actually travel those good old pre-pandemic days, and in his keynote, so debunking the myth that Kubernetes storage is hard, he basically said, you need to be using CSI for the simple reason it allows you to seamlessly stop swap storage in and out of your cluster. You deploy your CSI compliant plugin, that gives you a storage class. The storage class is what you use in your deployment configuration for your big data cluster. Your data is probably going to grow. So what I would recommend is that you, if you favor a CSI plugin that supports volume expansion. Uh, this is beta in Kubernetes 1.16. Ergo, you need a minimum version of Kubernetes of 1.16 also. You also need a CSI plugin that supports a minimum of the 1.1 for, uh, sorry, 1.1 spec. Uh, there's a Kubernetes CSI play page on GitHub. It's, it lists all the vendors that support this standard along with the, the version of the spec they support. Go and dig that out and go and have a look at that. Uh, backups. You need them. So there's two broad options. The first option is to use Microsoft big data cluster agnostic methods. And then the second option is to use the tools that ship with your uh, Microsoft SQL Server 2019 big data cluster. So in terms of agnostic backup options, uh, options that are agnostic to Microsoft, you have ETCD CTL for backing up your ETC. 
ETCD CTL databases. You have Valero, which I'm going to get onto in a bit. So this is a free community tool for backing up your entire cluster. Uh, go on to Google, Google um, Joe Beder. So that's Beder spelled B-E-D-A, Valero. He's got a, he's got a session on his uh, from his thank God it's it's Kubernetes series which covers Valero. That's a very good session. Look that up. That will give you a full primer into what Valero is. I'm only going to touch on this. Okay, and then you have third party commercial tools. So you have PX Backup which comes with Portworks, and you have Casten from Casten.io. Valero. So. You install a client, use a client to install a plugin on your Kubernetes cluster, and then typically this backs up your objects to an object store. Uh, that can be S3 or uh, Microsoft Azure Blob Storage. Uh, if you're doing this on premises, it's two options. Most storage vendors support S3 on their storage appliances. Alternatively, if you don't have one of those, you can spin up S3 storage yourself using MinIO. So Microsoft backup options. Uh, for your master and data pool, you can use good old SQL Server backup and restore. For your storage pool, you've got CRL, AZ Data, BDC, HDFS uh, copy, or if you're using HDFS tiering, which allows you to virtualize data in a object store. So that could be S3, or it could be uh, Azure uh, Blob Storage. You can use the, the, the tools and tooling, which is, which is native to that object store or object storage platform. Scaling. Um, one of the reasons why I gave you the 101 overview of a big data cluster to begin with was I wanted you to get a ba some basic familiarity with, with the pools that make up your big data cluster. So of your pools, there's pools which are CPU intensive, and then there's pools which are IO intensive. And the whole reason I'm mentioning this to you is that an architecture which allows you to scale up your CPU intensive components and your IO intensive components independently really is the way to go. And this is this is the whole way that the the IT industry is going. So if you consider things such as uh, Azure Synapse, Snowflake, AWS Redship, uh, Redshift, Vertica, when it's running on EM mode, all, there's one thing that all these data platforms have in common is that they all they're all not just big data platforms but they all allow you to, to scale up and down the, the 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 compute and storage elements of the platform independently and what i recommend that you do here is you go for an infrastructure approach which also allows this to do allows you to do this for your big data cluster uh, your storage pool I'm mentioning the storage pool more than the data pool, application pools, uh, master pools, because again, to, to run home, reiterate the pool, the, 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 the point, the storage pool is, is the, the part of your big data cluster that does all the heavy lifting. By default, this has a HDFS replication factor of three. This means that everything that you write to HDFS under your storage pool gets replicated three times. Okay, so if you're using the, the, the default replication factor of three, then on top of this, you've got some underlying storage platform that's doing its own replication. Guess what? This means that your data is written two times three, which if my mass ability serves me correctly, should still be six. This means that for every single bit, byte, K, megabyte, gigabyte of data that you're writing, you're not just writing this once, you're writing this six times over. And this could get worse. So if your underlying storage platform is doing this, is doing replication three times over, your two times three becomes three times three, which again, 
my math serves me correctly, is 9. Now, this may or may not be a problem. So in the early adopter program, there was an organization that was talking about storing a petabyte of data in uh, HDFS under the storage pool. I would ask the question, do you really want to be provisioning six petabytes of data or nine petabytes of data for the, the, the purpose of actually storing one petabyte of raw data. So the first thing that you want to do is, is if your storage platform is replicating data, what you can do is you can set the HDFS replication factor down to one in your configuration. So that is a better option. What you can also do is, is if your your storage platform natively supports things such as RAID or erasure coding, still set your replication factor down to one, and then what you'll get is, you'll get data that is only written once, okay? So the best case scenario in a, with a platform that replicates data is it's written twice, you always want to replicate it at least twice. With something that does smart things that uses erasure coding or, or RAID, you get this just once. Now, you might be able to get away with using storage replication. If your data is not large, that might be fine. As, as your data begins to grow, it might be something that is a concern for you. Upgrades. So, two ways you can perform upgrades. So there's in situ, which is Latin for in place. And imagine we're going from Kubernetes 1.16 to 1.19. First takeaway point here is that you cannot perform multi-version upgrades in Kubernetes. So if we were doing this, we'd have to go via 1.17, 1.18, and then finally we'd make the jump from 1.18 to 1.9. Okay, if we do this in place, let me walk you through this. Okay, so we upgrade a master node. We, we called it off to begin with, then we upgrade it from 1.16 to 1.17 okay then we upgrade a worker node we go from 1.16 to 1.7 and then bang if anything goes wrong we end up with a kubernetes cluster with nodes on different versions of kubernetes which is absolutely not the way you want to 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 go so what you might want to consider is an immutable infrastructure approach to upgrading your cluster and what a mutable infrastructure means is it means that we only ever do two things with components. We only, we only stand them up or we tear them down. So what we would do here is we would create a brand new cluster, which is at the target version that we want to go to. And then what we would do is we would copy or migrate the state from our original cluster to our new cluster. And there's a variety of ways you can do this. So there's, there's backup tools. Um, there's the snapshot technology and underlying snap, uh, uh, storage platform. Portworks have a really cool way of doing this. So this thing called PX Migrate, which allows you to migrate state from one Kubernetes to a plus, uh, cluster to another in a single command line call. OpenShift, what is it? Uh, if you've been following big data clusters and what Microsoft are doing, they, they've been mentioning Red Hat and OpenShift quite a bit so what is it it's it's built on top of kubernetes but it's kubernetes plus a a number of things which includes a built-in registry it includes a whole bunch of things which give you what is called a developer experience so you, you've got software to image functionality you can build software and, and you can create container images which go in the, the built-in registry directly from your source software um, it has strict security contacts, which you will be aware of if you've ever deployed a big data cluster on OpenShift. It comes with Jenkins integration. You have these things called image streams, which is a, a really cool way of being able to tag uh, images uh, with, with, with different tags. Um, there's a built-in service broker, commercial support, and there's tight OS integration. What I mean by tight OS integration is, is it means that 
there's a particular operating system that you need for your control plane nodes and a particular operating system, both of which come from Red Hat, which you need for your compute nodes. So let's have a look at some of the key differences. So as I mentioned, Kubernetes is a open source project which is managed under the auspices of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. OpenShift is a commercially supported platform as a service which is provided by Red Hat. And with Kubernetes, you can use most of the popular Linux distributions. So here I've got Ubuntu, SUSE, Red Hat, CentOS, etc. With OpenShift, it is opinionated, which means you must use uh, Red Hat Enterprise Lite Linux Core OS for your control plane nodes. For your compute nodes, you can use I've got here just, just Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You can use CoreOS as well. Uh, deployment, you can use KubeADM or KubeSpray. Uh, with OpenShift, you use something called an ignition script. So the way this works is, is you have a temporary host. Okay, You download an ignition script and an ignition key, and you boot up the entire cluster via this ignition script. If you're using bare metal, uh, which uh, works in its slickest form from OpenShift 4.6 onwards, it uses a thing called Metal 3 for bare metal provisioning. If you want to use what Red Hat calls user provisioned infrastructure, uh, which is commonly VMware, what you do is, is you, you use your ignition script that connects to your VMware vCenter, that creates virtual machines and it pulls down OVA virtual machine images. Your container engine. Kubernetes usually uses container D, which derives from the Docker engine. From version four onwards of OpenShift, it uses Cryo. Uh, Master nodes, control plane nodes, Kubernetes, you need a minimum of two for production. For, for OpenShift, uh, you should always go with three control plane nodes. Uh, load balancer, this is always recommended for Kubernetes. For deploying OpenShift, you need a, a, a load balancer. It's kind of mandatory. HA proxy is generally the way that most people go. Uh, Community free versions of, of the, the platforms. Kubernetes is, is free by its very nature. Uh, with OpenShift, there's this thing called OKD, which is OpenShift Community Edition. So why why does why does OpenShift matter? So first of all, uh, if you work in any IT function associated with very regular industries, so that might be in banking, utilities, government. Uh, you, if an auditor comes along, you need to be able to present that auditor with something which says that all the software that you use in production is commercially supported. As fantastic as Kubernetes is in its raw community form, it is not commercially supported. You are completely and utterly at the mercy of the people that support that project when it comes to bug fixers. With Red Hat, if you need bug fixers, you have got somewhere to go. Uh, next up, uh, the entire stack in terms of operating system and the platform as a service that, that OpenShift is, it's engineered to, to work together. Okay, So for a particular version of OpenShift, you've got that warm, fuzzy feeling and general comfort factor that you've got something that works together. So on paper, vanilla Kubernetes, it should work with most distributions of Linux. That is not to say, however, that there might be quirks, bugs, foibles, which means that if you go with a particular Linux distribution of a particular version, things might not work perfectly as you expect. This is not a problem with OpenShift. Strict enterprise grade security. Uh, what you will notice if you've ever installed a, a big data cluster on top of Kubernetes is, is that there's these things called uh, security contexts 
which you need to to uh, set up and alter before you deploy your big data cluster. And then finally, uh, one of the big things about Red Hat is they acquired a company called Coal CoreOS, who've made major contributions to the Kubernetes ecosystem in terms of software defined networking. So the very first soft, uh, software defined overlay networking uh, tool for, for Kubernetes was Flannel. That originates from CoreOS, as does ETCD. So that winds up the session. Uh, a big thank you and a shout out to the sponsors that, that uh, have made this event possible in part. Okay. Uh, also, uh, there's going to be uh, prizes which you can win. So post your selfie with the hashtag DPS2020 on Twitter. Please give session and conference feedback. Visit our, our sponsors and exhibitors in the, the virtual uh, lobby. Uh, follow us on Twitter at the Data Geeks at Data AI Summit. Thanks for watching this session. I hope you found this useful. Uh, I'll be around to, to answer any questions that you might have. My, my Twitter handle is uh, Chris Adkin8 on Twitter. So 8 is the digit 8. Uh, also, if you want to email me, I'm C Adkin, that's C A D K I N at purestories.com. Thanks ever so much for watching this session. <laughs>